May this message lead you to a deep reflection on the processes and tools of self-transformation provided by the renowned Yogi Sadhguru. If you want to start your yoga journey with Sadhguru, click on the link in the description of this video and learn more. It is all within us. Before you realize that, or how soon you realize that, will lead to either transformation or frustration. It may be just momentary for a whole lot of people, because people will feel terrified. You will see they were struggling in pain, this, that was happening. A few are bewildered, what's happening? Because they never thought this will happen to them. Sadhguru, I'm going to ask you to move to this poem called Human sure. on page 112. Oh, I like that number. Mm -hmm. One, one, two. Human. Human. Even when at home, I longed for home. Searing pain of longing for home, strangely got cured in being homeless. When the walls of home dissolved, a pristine home, unwalled and unfettered, devoid of love, affection or companions blossomed, shall I call it my being? But this is a poem about home and it is also a poem about... It's a poem about a kind of homesickness and then it's a poem about a kind of homelessness and then it's a poem about homecoming. And I wanted you to tell us more about that journey because I think in some way many of us have shared that journey but not on the level of... not on the profundity that you're talking about it here, but I think many of us have had glimpses of that journey. Is this the blueprint for almost every seeker? See, I would say uh, there's literally no human being who is not confronted with a thought and an emotion like that, but they manage to brush it aside. It doesn't bother them enough. The pain of not knowing doesn't tear them, that's the whole problem. They come to terms with ignorance. They make a deal with ignorance. They will build relationships where everybody will confirm this is the best way to live. Of comfort, companionship, love, affection. These are all things you're seeking. I know a whole lot of people have raised human emotions to heavens. If you say love, they say divine love. If you say joy, they say divine joy. If you say bliss, they say divine bliss. <laughs> You don't need any God's help to be joyful, loving, peaceful. As a human being, you're endowed with these qualities. So all those who deprived themselves of that, they either seek God or they settle for a dog. Yeah, usually. Uh, because they want a unconditional love, this is a demand. <laughs> because the nature of love is such that it's like a flower, if you don't watch it for two minutes, it'll fall. It'll wither and fall right there. Either you want to let it fall, or you have to nourish it every moment, or you have to concretize it. That means you take a picture and keep it on your phone screen, or you institutionalize it with marriage or this or that. So essentially, well, I'm… I'm not against any institution because institutions are needed in the world to operate, otherwise there will be chaos. That is a different thing. But you cannot institutionalize joy or peace like right now we think United Nations is uh, the institution for peace. No, no, you cannot institutionalize peace. You cannot institutionalize joy. You cannot institutionalize love or anything for that matter. Institutions are functional instruments in a given society. I have utmost respect for them, 
because without it, people, a whole lot of people wouldn't know how to live. You need institutions, there is a government, there is a democratic process, there are variety of things, all right? There are courts, there are parliaments. Well, uh, ninety percent of the time some nonsense may be happening there, but still these institutions are important because without that there will be total chaos. So I'm not talking against institutions, but institutionalizing things that happen within a human being is a silly effort. But is it possible to embark on a journey without this sense of homeless, homesickness? See, uh, let one human being honestly say, when you are with your most loving parents, however doting and wonderful they were to you, that you never felt this is not where you want to be. That is a dishonest human being. Because love gets tedious, somebody's fondness gets very tedious, comfort gets tedious. Because the nature of life is, it wants to constantly expand. If there is no room for expansion, it doesn't matter, you are kept in a uh, whatever, I won't use because everybody uses the word golden palace. I think golden palace is totally anesthetic in my uh <laughs> <laughs> My visual perception, I hate golden palace, but whatever is the most wonderful palace or as you say Shangri-La or whatever, you will… it'll get tedious. All the heaven-bound people, they don't know how bored they will be within three days in that place of goodness. So I'm saying it doesn't matter, it's not because there's something wrong with your parents. They may be most wonderful people, but the very nature of a human being is such. Only if you are a pet animal, if you have reduced yourself to that, you're just happy with the meals that you're getting and somebody is fondling you once in a way and you're happy with that. For that you must be a pet animal, you should not be born as a human being. Once you're born as a human being, it is natural wanting to break barriers. So when you're young as a child or a teenager, you think barriers means they're all physical. Before you understand, the barriers are not really physical. Whether you build your own house or you live in your parents' house or you live uh, in a slave master's house, the house and walls are not the barrier. It is all within us, before you realize that or how soon you realize that will lead to either transformation or frustration. And this home, homelessness, these year, this whole phase of vagabondage, of being a nomad, you have poems about being a nomad. Is that also an intrinsic part of every seeker's journey? See, do not separate seekers and non-seekers, everybody is a seeker. Some quickly compromise, some endure. There is nobody who is not a seeker. Some seek and forage within their own limitations, some want to seek, some seek in a safe manner, some seek dangerously. But there is nobody who is not a seeker, everybody is a seeker. And therefore, this period of homelessness or vagabondage is universal? It may not be a period for everybody. It may be just momentary for a whole lot of people because people will feel terrified when they feel if they just look at it and see actually, you know, just the nature of life. Forget about your home. Suppose you left somewhere, you know, I've seen people uh, you know, when we were children, when we were growing up, Mysore has a Dasara exhibition which goes on for one and a half months. So this is a place where all the youth will go and hang out and you know, there are things to eat and a lot of entertainment, shows going on, music going on, various kind of uh, circus elements and all things going on. In this… <laughs> in this exhibition grounds which is hardly maybe ten, fifteen acres, maybe twenty acres of land and full of lights everywhere and shops and stuff's going on. 
Every day, either children or women or some men, they get lost from their families in that crowd. Maybe fifty thousand to hundred thousand people will be milling around and uh, people get lost. <laughs> All the time when the music show is happening, one policeman will announce, there is a child here by name Vikram, his father's name is uh, this thing, <laughs> his mother's name is this thing, he is crying here, come immediately. Hey, God damn it, we came to listen to music. <laughs> if you brought a child, figure out how to hold on to you. If you don't figure that out, ask him to come and wait at the gate and pick him up there. Nothing is going to happen, all right? These are not times where great amount of kidnappings happening, anything in Mysore, nobody kidnaps you in Mysore. At least nobody kidnapped me <laughs> So, this ridiculous thing and grown-up women, they're lost from their husband or their family. Bah! Crying in the middle of the road, bah! bah. It's a well-lit place, the whole damn place is overlit. all right? There were no phones, that was the only thing. All you have to do is go near the gate and wait or if you're a car or a motorcycle, go and wait there or just stand there. Let's see if your man wants to find you or not <laughs> I'm saying they will be… even men, I have seen grown-up men crying loudly because their wife or their child had gone somewhere. Unbelievable. So the sense of being lost, nothing, you don't have to drop them in the middle of Kalahari or something. <laughs> in Mysore, Dasara exhibition <laughs> I know Mysore people will be listening and say, how can Sadhguru speak like this? Does he know the pain of getting lost in Dasara exhibition <laughs> I'm saying this is how people are. I've seen people in the jungles when some of my friends came with me, in the forest, not even deep inside, just in the borders of the forest, somewhere they go here, there and they get lost. They're just… just few meters away somewhere and they can't see us. Bah! They start crying. <laughs> Grown-up boys <laughs> I've been lost in the forest for days and weeks, don't know where the hell I'm going. I know if I keep walking some road, something will come because I know how wide Western Ghats are. At the most, hundred-fifty, two-hundred kilometers if I walk, I will come to the coast or to some city. <laughs> but in the meantime, you should see how people behave. Because for them, nothing big needs to happen. Smallest things, if they lose their wallet, psst. <laughs> they lose their phone, gone. Everything is gone, all right? So they don't have to lose their life. This is why I said, when… Uh, when a time comes when you're going to lose your body and everything that you know as life, either terror will come when they first realize that, but slowly as life starts ebbing, it gives you a certain anesthetic. This is the nature of life because life doesn't just pop out like this. It is leaving slowly. As it starts leaving slowly, you will see there is a kind of an anesthetic, there's a kind of comfort that they come to. You will see they were struggling in pain, this, that was happening. But as death is slowly coming, approaching, last few days you see they become peaceful, nice, some of them even joyful. A few are bewildered what's happening because they never thought this will happen to them. So being lost is not about a certain situation, it is the nature of life. It is the nature of life. You have been given the intelligence to find out what is the nature of life. If you did not have the intelligence, if you were like any other creature, none of them have those problems. They are never lost. They are all fine. Physically, they may be lost in the terrain sometimes, but otherwise they are just fine. They never feel lost. This is the greatest privilege that human being has you can be lost. Just believe me, if you cannot be lost, obviously you are chained, isn't it? You are chained? Of course. See, these days I've seen, uh, especially in the United States, people are taking their children with a… what do you call this? Uh, On a leash? A leash, like a dog leash. 
they can pull it, there is a thing where you can shorten the leash or lengthen the leash according to the traffic and whatever else is happening. A child is running, it's on a leash. Maybe for single mothers it's a convenient way of handling, I can understand there are not two, three people to run after the child. The mother doesn't have the energy of the child because he runs all over the place. Maybe it's a practical solution, I'm not commenting about that. But one who is on the leash or a chain cannot be lost, isn't it? You need to understand, being lost is a great privilege because you are not on a chain. The popular teachings in the world today, I don't know how popular these are in Mumbai, but in the West, these things have become very popular. Somebody is telling you, be in the moment. Somebody is telling you, just let go, everything will be okay. That means there must be somebody taking care of your life from behind, then you can let go. Someone telling you, just do one thing at a time, don't… See, these are all regressive teachings in the sense, just to explore one or two. What can you let go, tell me? They're saying, just let go, God will do it. Well, <laughs> Life has not really gotten you yet, that's why you're talking this language. You're living in a fanciful world. When life really gets you, then you will know you can't let go anything you have to manage. You let go your business today and see what will happen. Or try something more dramatic, you're driving today, just let go. A lot of people seem to have. Just let go and see, either you are dead or somebody else is dead. <laughs> now, these popular teachings, which have unfortunately become popular, has messed up humanity in a big way. I… I faced a group of people recently in America, where they're staunch be-in-the-moment people. I'm asking you, can you be somewhere else? Be somewhere else and show me, please. Can any of you be anywhere else other than this moment, I'm asking? Can you be? Can you be somewhere else than here, right now? No. Then why do you need such a teaching? What they're trying to tell you is, don't think about tomorrow, don't think about yesterday. That will happen if you take away half your brain. If I pull out half your brain, you cannot think about tomorrow, you cannot think about yesterday, just be in the moment. This is all coming because people do not even know how to sit in one place peacefully, okay? So people are coming up with solutions like this. Shankaran Pillai opened a pharmacy in United States. And one day he had something to attend to, some little chore that he has to attend to. So he asked his teenage son, please take care of the shop just for an hour, I'll be back. So boy said, no problem, dad. So he went out, in an hour's time he came back. When he came back, in front of the shop, there was a man hugging the lamp, lamp post and his eyeballs were rolling wildly and he was looking totally crazy. He looked at the man, whether the man is wanting to go into the shop or is he going out of the shop, you don't know. So he looked at him and then he went inside and he asked his son, who is that guy hugging the lamppost like that? Is he our customer? The boy said, yes, dad, he's our customer. What did you give him? 
Oh, he had you whooping cough, so I gave him a box of laxatives and made him take it right here, all of them. I said, what? For whooping cough, you gave him laxatives? Why? There are… N See, the way uh, the question is asked and also the way normally it's addressed is, people think uh, there is something called as negative thought and positive thought, they want to remove the negative thoughts and have only positive thoughts. For such people, I would ask them to just experiment for uh, ten, fifteen seconds. Let them forcefully remove one thought from their mind. For example, next ten seconds, just don't think of a monkey. Try not to think of a monkey for next ten seconds. You will see you will be full of monkeys. So what I am saying is, this is the nature of your mind, because in this mind, all the three pedals are throttled. There is no brake, there is no clutch, whatever you touch, it will only go faster. In this kind of mind, people have been taught from moral teachers and religious teachers, do not think about bad things. Well, since then it's been a full-time job. So there is no way you can handle the mind like this, this doesn't need any great enlightenment. If you spend two minutes with your eyes closed, you will realize you cannot do anything forcefully with this mind. So, I want to remove negative thoughts. Do not ever go in this direction because what you want to remove will become your quality. Always you will be on it. So, what should I do? The thing is this, without understanding the fundamental mechanism of this mind, because our mind, human mind, is the most sophisticated computer on the planet. Even all the supercomputers have come out of this. When this is the case, is it not important that we understand the mechanics of how it functions? One simplistic aspect of how it functions is, there are no subtractions and divisions in our mind. There is only addition and multiplication. If you try to do something with it, it will say one more. If you try hard, it will multiply into many more. In this mind, you don't try to identify what is positive, what is negative and try to remove it. First of all, one needs to understand, this mind of yours, this body of yours is supposed to serve you. The life that you are is important. Body and mind are vehicles that must serve us. If you sit in a vehicle, it must go where you want to go. If it goes to its own destination, what is the point of such a vehicle? It's just a nuisance. Right now, most human beings are unfortunately experiencing this fantastic possibility of human mind as a nuisance, as a troublesome thing. Well, this is the most beautiful thing you have. It's just that you need to pay little attention as to how it functions. One simple thing is this, first and foremost process is that's why we put out this uh, process called Isha Kriya. This is, is… What means focus to you in, and which way can we apply focus in our daily life? So what's your definition of focus? Okay. Yes, uh, there are many ways to describe this word. Instead of saying focus, if you use the word attention, would you agree that attention and focus are about the same thing? There is a little difference, there is… there are nuances to it. But when you say focus, it's just like focusing a light on something means only a focus is always a spot. Attention can be much more widespread. See, right now, if you have clear vision, I am having problems seeing the young man because you kept him in darkness there in the hall <laughs> But if the hall was well lit, I don't have to focus myself to see the people who are sitting here. I just need attention. If I am attentive, I will see all the people here the way they are. But now I get interested in this one young man, then I need focus. If I had only focus without the general attention about everything around me, indiscriminate attention I'm talking about, 
attention not even about something, just being attentive because only because there is a certain level of attention and awareness within you, you even know that you exist. Otherwise, let's say in sleep, in your experience, neither the world exists nor you exist, all that's happened is there is no attention, because there is no attention, there is no perception of any kind. 